Okay, so now let us uh, invite our next uh, invited speaker, Professor uh, Mangidas uh, Malinas Kos, and uh, his topic of uh, presentation is uh, heavy duty and uh, high performance 3D micro optics uh, made by laser additive manufacturing. Now let us uh, listen to the biography of uh, Professor Mangidas from uh, Daniel. With pleasure, sir. Professor Malinakas Mad uh, Mangridas uh, defended his PhD in 2010 at Vilnius University. Uh, his title was Laser Fabrication of Functional 3D Polymetric Micro -nan uh, Nanostructures. Uh, during his career, he had made traineeships in LZH and 4th slash EISLR. In 2019 to 2022, he was a specially appointed professor at Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, Technologies Group uh, of Professor J. Morikawa. Currently, he continues investigation into fundamental study on laser 3D micro nanostructuring of cross linkable materials for applications in micro optics, nano optics, and biomedicine at VULRC. Financing for the laboratory is acquired by national, European, and worldwide funding schemes. Okay, so thank you very much, Daniel. So now let us welcome our uh, speaker, Professor Mangidas, to give his uh, invited talk. So thank you for introducing me. Thanks for organizing and possibility to present uh, here my results. Uh, I will continue on the same uh, trend started with uh, Okay, share screen. So not to, to, to make, I have only one screen, so must work. Uh, so on, on the same direction where Solus uh, started and Maria continued, you must see my screen, right? Okay, good. Uh, and I have a laser pointer. Uh, but for some more specific uh, applications, mainly in micro optics and how to combine it with uh, calcination or in other ways uh, to make it inorganic and even further functionalized by uh, adding coatings, which may improve the quality of the optics. So this corresponds to the title of a talk, yes, about making heavy duty, high performance micro optics by laser additive manufacturing. Uh, a few words uh, about technique will follow. My main uh, acknowledgement goes to fighters from Ukraine fighting for uh, their own and our freedom. So we are available here to discuss our uh, scientific uh, topics. So thanks to heroes and Mariupol is Ukraine. A uh, few words about our uh, group. It's called Laser Nanophotonics in the Laser Research Center of Physics Faculty at Vilnius University. We investigate quite uh, diverse topics from uh, fundamental light matter interaction and specifically uh, its applications for direct laser writing conditions or in other words, 3D printing. One of the application directions is uh, integrated uh, and multifunctional micro optical devices, as well as uh, Maria presented scaffolds, biomedical uh, and, and some other biomedical applications and uh, also uh, some photonics and uh, 3D printing uh, in, in general, especially uh, expanding it uh, towards uh, new materials like bioresins or inorganic ones. We, we have uh, lots of partners, uh, scientific partners worldwide, and uh, some sig significant closer relation with uh, laser companies uh, inside Lithuania. This is uh, our group. I would like uh, specifically to stress the uh, input of uh, Dr. Daros Gilevichus, who will be presenting on some other topic uh, later in the afternoon, and uh, Antanas Butkus, who will give a, a, a poster presentation again in the later afternoon. So uh, about thresholding and, and scaling in three dimensions. So I just can specify it more to polymer uh, materials, but basically it, it continues on the trend uh, presented by, by Professor Solis Yotkesis, that we once we uh, tightly focus light beam, we can control the light uh, matter interaction interaction at small scales in short dura durations and induce a uh, localized photopolymerization reaction, which allows us arbitrary 3D shaping with uh, near to hundreds of nanometers in resolutions. The excitation mechanisms can be various from single photon, few photon, or, or uh, actually 
as recent studies uh, showed, it can be a mixture or a specifically uh, enhanced one or another way to, to excite the materials, but all in all, eventually it uh, turns into photochemical uh, reactions, yes, so for into polymerization, and uh, depending on the material and the developing conditions, we can uh, reach small dimensions and uh, produce 3D structuring, repeatable and, and quality one. Uh, our uh, one of our like uh, strong contributions to the field is uh, making it scalable and mesoscale. Uh, the specific uh, work done by Dr. Lina Sjernoshauskas, who made a mesoscale butterfly. Uh, why mesoscale and what does it mean? So we we're not uh, I would say satisfied and precise to just call it uh, nanoscale because its dimensions are over uh, millimeters. And at the same time, if we would call it micrometer or my millimeter, it wouldn't be precise uh, just to, to prove my words. So the dimensions are, uh, the wingspan is exceeding the millimeters, uh, while antennas are in, in the range of hundreds of micrometers. Uh, the, uh, the eyes, the compound eyes, like op optical devices are of range of tens of micrometers, whereas the Embedded nano lattice is uh, below 100 nanometer, uh, below 100 uh, micrometer in dimensions, uh, consisting of, uh, uh, just in this case, around 650 nanometers. And all in all, this makes a multi scale structure, and uh, which as a polymer uh, can be functionalized with organic, inorganic uh, additives, whether it would be fluorescent dyes, uh, lasing dyes, nanoparticles, quantum loss, or even in, in, in inorganic uh, compounds. And for making it optically active or uh, tuning its uh, physical as well as chemical properties. Uh, regarding additive manufacturing, it uh, as, as as an additive manufacturing tool, so laser lithography might look very uh, slow, since it's uh, in the range of uh, cubic millimeters per minute, uh, ten to minus uh, order minus three. But counting in separate uh, voxels, so it's uh, quite efficient, actually very efficient technique, producing more than uh, thirty thousand individual voxels per second. So in throughput, normalized to, to its dimensions, it's a very efficient technique. And uh, uh, just for, for, for your knowledge, this wall butterfly was made in two and a half uh, hours of laser writing. Now, a bit more uh, specifics are on, on the fabrication used for micro-optics. So femtosecond laser, uh, for our purpose, it was a, a sufficient uh, uh, Second oscillator, but as Saul has uh, mentioned, the, the main important parameter is, is to reach terawatts per square centimeter intensities at the sample uh, using tight focusing. So these are the typical values, like looking pretty small, like milliwatts in power, ter around terawatt in, in intensity, and we can achieve repeatable uh, scanning speeds for around a millimeter per second for producing a uh, micro optics. More details can be found in our uh, recent. Uh, papers describing specifically this technique and its structuring. It is uh, commercially available at uh, company Femtica, all integrated and user-friendly, uh, well, not tabletop, but standalone 3D nanoprinter. The concept, uh, I, I will talk more in details uh, today, is based on uh, calcination, as, as uh, I previously asked a question uh, to Maria, which uh, basically uh, employs uh, hybrid material, it can start with as a 2080 uh, and, and its uh, derivatives and we perform the lithography, we develop, we get the 3D structure and uh, then heat it at uh, elevated temperatures, uh, typically 1000 or, or even higher ones, whether in an uh, inert atmosphere or, or in air, in ambient air, air atmosphere and remove the organic part. So all the acrylates, metacrylates, uh, uh, or epoxy or whatever materials it would be, the organic compounds containing uh, carbon and hydrogen will evaporate and will result into inorganic substance, but will be preserving the defined 3D shape. So we'll get the 3D structure printed via photopolymerization, but without the polymer itself, without the uh, left organic uh, particles. Uh, this technique was... Uh, uh, they developed to great extent by uh, Greta Merkininkaite, and uh, we can call it as a two-photon photopolymerization or laser direct writing uh, 
super powered for, by in or, uh, option to print inorganic materials. Just to have imagination on the temperature scale, so uh, the polymerization and all the material pre preparation uh, works uh, at a uh, room or near to room temperatures. Uh, we heat it uh, at a uh, higher uh, temperatures, like exceeding 140 or 50 degrees, we start cross-linking of uh, uh, all uh, possible uh, carbon bonds. And eventually, if we apply higher temperatures, we start to evaporate the smaller uh, organic uh, compounds. We start to break them, depolymerize, and eventually all the organics are removed. And uh, finally, we will result into some inorganic substance, which will depend on initial uh, ingredients of our hybrid resin. So we can expect to achieve crystallite, silicon dioxide, uh, monoclinal or tetragonal zirconia as a final product if we use uh, as a 2080 material. So the other slide is just summarizing the technique that we just as, as, as Maria mentioned, we can tune the initial properties, the composition of a material, which will uh, in turn uh, result in different uh, properties uh, of a 3D printed object after laser writing and developing, and eventually in the ma uh, material composition after performing the calcination. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, the achievable resolution with calcination can be in in increased further on and uh, reach below 100 nanometers without any spe specific uh, material optimization or beam shaping techniques like STECT or, or others. Uh, just by uh, reduction of the volume and of the uh, features while keeping its shape. Uh, so we can achieve amorphous glass or even crystalline ceramic uh, substances and keep the shape. Uh, uh, why, why it is beneficial besides making inorganic uh, substances? So it is uh, once heated to high temperatures, it could be repeatedly reheated. So it's a uh, temperature resilient to extremely high temperatures, 1,000, uh, it's, it's, it's not the actual limit. We have tested it uh, towards uh, other direction to uh, achieve uh, very low temperatures and uh, even uh, soaking into uh, liquid uh, nitrogen. Uh, so it, it does not break, uh, delaminate or, 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 or detach from the substrate. It's quite rigid, it's, it's very rigid. It is, uh, chemically resilient to both uh, acidic and uh, basic environments and uh, can withstand uh, many cycles of uh, low, high uh, vacuum uh, or, or pressure uh, conditions. So it makes a very technological material, I would say, which can sustain all kinds of uh, uh, harsh environments, chemical, physical, uh, mechanical, temperature, and be of high resolution at the same time can be scalable up to five millimeters. At least the, it's, this is the range we, where we tested it. Okay, so let's move to what we can do with it. And uh, work done by uh, Diana as a Europhotonics uh, student at that time in, in our university. Uh, so applying it for micro optics, we need to optimize the shape to do some pre-compensation uh, like sacrificial structures or support structures, which after annealing will bend, but the, do not uh, limit the shrinkage of our uh, design component. And eventually we can result in a uh, crunk, about 40% optical device, which uh, as pristine, so centered, uh, can perform all kind of uh, optical functions like uh, imaging, uh, magnification, uh, be highly transparent and, and suitable for optical applications. Uh, we have published this uh, work in the uh, photonics uh, journal, oh, an open access one. And here are some uh, examples of uh, imaging performance before calcination of free lenses. After calcination, we see that uh, the, uh, our lens shrinks, but it performs imaging uh, and uh, the result features can reach below five micrometers. Uh, for single element uh, and, and, and uh, clearly re resolve whatever uh, object we're having at. In this case, it was a USF uh, 1951 uh, target or chart structure. So by simply uh, using it in, in, in putting into a 
laser fabrication setup, we could achieve this uh, imaging uh, properties characterization. What else? Of course, uh, everyone is in, in, interested in uh, how resilient the optics is. And as uh, we imagine, if we make it plastic or organic, so where uh, resilience and transparency will be limited. But once you calcinate, so the properties are improved. And as uh, shown here, the work performed by uh, Darius and his student, Rokas Zwerblis. Uh, so they made an uh, extensive study of uh, optical damage experiment of a produced micro lenses, both uh, focusing into the lens itself and uh, checking uh, and, and next to it, checking the how much of uh, non-focused light uh, the produced micro lenses uh, can sustain. Uh, so two distinguished cases for localized around four micrometers and non-localized of more than uh, 20 micrometers or so. Uh, to have uh, some uh, statistical repeatability, an array of uh, micro lenses uh, was made, and all of them, of them were individually tested using the same uh, laser fabrication uh, setup. Uh, or, or sorry, no, not the same, but amplified laser uh, fabrication setup. So basically, uh, lesser pulse repetition, uh, higher energies, so the damage threshold could be reached easily, and. Uh, it's, uh, choosing two uh, exposure conditions, whether a short one, 50 milliseconds, or up to five uh, seconds to see the accumulated uh, fatigue of, uh, on the micro lenses. Uh, this shows the proof of uh, 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 optical quality of uh, micro lenses and, and their imaging uh, properties. And as, as we can see that after uh, calcination and after damage test, the, the lenses which were survived, they, uh, do not show any degradation in uh, imaging, whereas, of course, the, the damaged ones are kind of uh, uh, distracted and they were not working as 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 the lens ones, uh, as lenses. Yes, this was to to prove the fact that uh, if if there is no obvious uh, destruction seen for the lens itself, so their op its optical properties are not uh, deteriorated uh, as well, and. Finally, some uh, summarizing uh, results of, uh, okay, may maybe look, uh, it, it looks uh, overcrowded and, and uh, messy, but it stands for uh, two types of uh, uh, measurements, localized four micrometers and non-localized, so 20 micrometers, whether we focus into the lens or pass light through the lens. And uh, for non-calcinated and calcinated uh, objects and two uh, different wavelengths. Uh, visible, 515, green light of femtoseconds, and uh, near infrared, the first harmonic of Faros laser, so 1030 nanometers. And in two different uh, durations, whether shorter exposure time or 50 milliseconds or five seconds. And basically, in all cases, we see an improvement uh, for the calcinated uh, lenses, so for inorganic ones. Uh, whether short or in small spot or, or larger and longer durations, uh, visible or near infrared wavelengths. Uh, actually, the difference uh, is, is uh, not the same. It, for some uh, cases, it, it, it is improved up to six times. For some, it's, it's like a three to three and a half. Uh, or, or for a non-localized, it, it gets uh, le lesser, it's slightly reduced to two and, and uh, less than two times, like uh, one and a half uh, times. But in, in principle, all, all in all cases, the calcination or the production of inorganic uh, lenses is uh, beneficial for the damage threshold. We have some uh, experience in, in, in measuring the, the films. Uh, the structures, the photonic lattices, uh, the lenses itself, and, and this time we were able to, to measure the improvement uh, provided by calcination process. The very next few slides uh, will be about uh, ongoing work on uh, about uh, making uh, even more transparent and more, more functional uh, optics, uh, exploiting atomic layer deposition. Uh, this uh, image represents the principle, which was shown uh, actually a year or slightly less than a year ago by uh, Professor Harald Giesen from Stuttgart University, where they uh, coated anti-reflective uh, coating on their mid-micro lens, 
actually I would call it millilens milli because it was hundreds of millimeters, or almost like uh, five millimeters in dimensions. But the applied principle of uh, uh, using atomic layer deposition allowed them to coat uh, silicon dioxide and titanium dioxide uh, coatings to make it uh, transparent for visible wavelengths and increase it from 92 to 99% of this uh, multi-layer coating, the transparency factor. Uh, we continued on this work, and the first main difference is the, our used uh, material was uh, coming from uh, fourth ISL, so as a 2080TM. Uh, also, we managed to uh, make the lenses much smaller, like below 100 micrometers. Uh, in this case, it's around 70 micrometers, the diameter of a lens, and stack them like uh, multi-layered uh, structures to make a, a compound lens devices. The fabrication was repeatable as well as uh, coating. We see before and after coating. The, the image is uh, clearer in, in the bottom one because we could uh, coat with uh, a, a for uh, conductive layer needed for SEM. But uh, in both cases, uh, we see that the imaging is uh, possible and the uh, imaging with uh, coated anti reflective uh, coating is in increased. The contrast uh, becomes better, which is as expected. Uh, this, the, the summary of a of, uh, protocol, how to produce it, this is shown here. So the same 3D structuring, developing, then coating. Uh, in our case, it was just uh, two layers. So simpler coating of uh, aluminum uh, dioxide uh, coating uh, mixed with, uh, with uh, or coated on top of uh, titanium dioxide uh, coating. And, uh, Basically, it increased the transparency for, for visible wavelengths, uh, specifically op optimized for uh, red light. Uh, the, the coating work was done in uh, Center for Physical Sciences and Technology in uh, Dr. Linas Grinevichutes' uh, laboratory, but it showed that both the platforms or the flat surfaces have significant uh, increase in transparency, reaching almost uh, theoretical threshold so no uh no 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 light loss uh, de depending on 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 the number of layers so for this purpose we tested from one two three layers and as we see uh, the non coated uh, transparency is reduced from 95 to 88 to 80 percent so every next layer significantly reduces the passing light whereas if applying the coating it seems like it's 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 not uh, dropping at all or or measuring from the reflections in in in, in contrast it, it seems like of improving but this is due to uh, the performed uh, calculation and this is valid for uh, not only flat surfaces for uh, functional lenses uh, which can image and their image contrast and transparency performance is um, improved as well the work was done by Karolis Galonauskas, and we see his uh, first uh, letter of his name is being imaged uh, perfectly. And uh, so this uh, basically summarizes uh, my, my talk that we can make the optics inorganics of high resilience, uh, high laser damage resilience, and at the same time, highly transparent. Of course, the next work would be to combine it both to make it high damage threshold and uh, highly resilient. And this is what we're working on. But meanwhile, I want to uh, end my talk by showing that the field of micro optics was uh, growing steadily for, for a long time, for a decade or so. And for the last, uh, okay, seven years, maybe it starts to, to uh, grow exponentially, like pandemic wise. Uh, just because it's entering uh, from or turning from innovators uh, stage to early adopter stage and the prototyped and made uh, micro optical devices are not just for like uh, for scientific applications but they're entering the real world uh, applications where high quality micro optical devices are are needed and can be used for uh, imaging uh, processing of, of of signals transferring as well as uh, material processing as well. So I, I find it as it should uh, be combined with holographic techniques for imaging and material processing as well in the near future. Okay, so my time is over. Thank you for your attention. But if you have questions, comments or discussions, we can have it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mangidas, for this uh, very interesting presentation. 
especially the results which you have shown with uh, 100x magnification the imaging results are uh, i think uh, very valuable to both imaging as well as holography applications okay so now let us see if we have uh, questions from the audience okay so there is a question from daniel smith hi yes um i couldn't help but see a uh, very early on in the presentation when you had when you were explaining the um process by which when you go to annealing, it, it, it shrinks. Um, and I, I couldn't help but notice that it looked like, uh, yes, this one. Uh, oops. Uh, uh, one this, more, one more forward. This one. One more. Yes, this one. Uh, so for, um, oh. no, this, this yes. one. Yes, yes. It delays, yeah, okay. Yeah, when, uh, so for pick, uh, for section D, um, you notice how it's got these curved uh, marks in the initial stage. And then when you do the calcination, it goes to these straight um, straight pillars. I was wondering uh, if that mechanical, um, I guess, mechanical uh, process can be how well understood that is. Like what makes it go straight, become straight? Uh yeah, the main reason I would say that it's uh, uh, stuck to it stick to the substrate, so it cannot move. Whereas the the upper parts of the object of both the supports and the lens, they can shrink, so they do shrink. Uh, and uh, the processes that uh, you have a reduction of mass, the organic parts goes like it's evaporated. So the carbon and hydrogen, which is a necessity for polymerization, is evaporated, whereas the silicon and the zirconium remains. So we ah. remove around uh, half of the material, which is proportional, okay, not shown in this study, but uh, uh, we have a, a research basically dedicated to, to, to this phenomena. Yes, so it is shrinking and uh, it's proportional to, to the organic part. Yes, and, and uh, depending on the heating parameters, we reduce the volume and the dimensions. So it's downscaling, but we can uh, predict it and make it this precompensated, like for lenses, so that the lens is not deformed, it's just shrank. If we would make it straight legs, so they would be bended. Yeah, so we need to allow the shrinkage occur. Otherwise, it it will depend on the on the substrate. So it's it's not uh, really, or actually, at this uh, stage, it's not uh, absolutely clear how it will behave on the fixed substrate, substrates. To some extent, it will shrink. From some, it may start cracking or deforming. But if you allow it uh, freely to shrink, so it's just a reduction of mass and scale. But it's pretty proportional and repeatable. And yeah, in this, it's, it was around 40%, both also the angle as, uh, the, as the shrinkage. But if we would okay. have more of uh, organic, it would shrink more. If more inorganic, it would shrink less. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so I have, okay, there is one more question from Professor Solius. Oh, yeah, thank you for, for interesting talk. So I, I was uh, wondering about this uh, atomic layer deposition part. Um, so you already was uh, using it on calcinated uh, surfaces, right? Not yet. It's uh, independent. Uh, at this stage, it's independent. But next... Uh, next so it means it was already used on the plastic ones, yeah? It's, it's let's say, poly polymerized or yeah, so only. Gieson's work was only on uh, organic ones, on plastic, I believe IPS resin. Ours mm -hmm. is on uh, Maria's made hybrid material, yes. But yeah, so my question would be, yeah, my question is about the chemistry of atomic layer deposition. So do you see its uh, compatibility? Uh, so could it be that some, some chemistry would be not working on some of um, polymeric um, lenses or micro optical elements because of, of the not compatible chemistry in the atomic layer deposition of silica and alumina or um, zirconia hafnia for example is also very popular for atomic layer deposition high refractive index um but um let's say on inorganic it's obvious but if you are using polymers could it be that you can't coat um 
um, any polymers like, I don't know, Norland uh, adhesive um, polymer is used for micro optics or PD mass, for example, or anything can be coated by atomic layer deposition with the silica and alumina. Okay, uh, good question. And my first answer is partially based on, on, on experience and partially on, uh, on, on my thoughts, uh, is uh, the temperature can be a limiting factor, at least with uh, based on discussions with uh, Lina Grinevich Uter's group. So uh, for some uh, coating, uh, for some material coating, you need uh, elevated temperatures, not very high, but 150 or 200. And if you are heating the yeah. normal adhesive, perhaps they will start uh, evaporating at least a bit and deform. And this might affect your, your shape of the object. Uh, whereas if you have inorganic uh, substance, then this basically doesn't matter. If you won't reach the temperatures needed for calcination. You will work in hundreds of uh, degrees of Celsius. So you'll be safe all the time. And uh, also for hybrid materials, it's not reaching the calcination. So the adhesion should be better due to uh, silicon uh, existing in, 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 in the 3D printed object, as well as uh, better mechanical and thermal resilience in general, even if you don't reach uh, high temperatures. By the way, I did not mention here due to, due to length of the presentation, but uh, um, Harald Giesen supplied uh, deposition was uh, above 100 degrees, 160 or so, ours uh, was uh, 90 degrees, which is, again, more compatible with uh, plastic and, and uh, with melting uh, point materials in general. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so are there any other questions from the audience? So I, I have a question, Professor Mangidas. So, I mean, we used to make uh, designs for, uh, say, thin diffractive elements so we create it in uh, say bmp uh, create it as a bmp file and then convert it into gds2 format but in your case you have multiple layers and it looks more complicated so how how to create i mean the design file for uh, such a device uh, yes this, this, this is one of, of the questions where uh, we're working on uh, not uh, to too much Experience at, at, at this time, we're using uh, Oslo and uh, designing program, yes, for optical uh, setups, yes, and schemes, and basically letting it uh, do its work. So, uh, I mean, there are two, two ways uh, to, to, to work on it, whether to, uh, to make a lens and uh, model what or compound optical elements and, and a model of what uh, light properties after propagation it, it should uh, or to optimize based on the results you want yes and kind of uh, reverse engineer what optical element you would need uh, up to our uh, experience using the commercial available as uh, Oslo software it, it worked both ways it's just provides quite different designs. Well, in one case, you have thicker lenses, in other one, you have finer lenses, but uh, it seems more uh, related whether you can manage to fabricate it or not. Uh, but uh, eventually, yes, it's uh, it's a task for perhaps for deep learning. That's why I was uh, asking yesterday, Professor Etienne Russell, yes, so uh, is it a good way to optimize based on what you produce and what uh, optical performance it gives to reverse engineer to to optim uh, to update your model because both the, the model can be not very precise and the fabrication will have some deviations uh, and if done manually it would uh, require many iterations or 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 uh, like uh, shown in this example not exactly doing good but uh, perhaps many many structures to test all of them which is the best so here, I believe deep learning can help a lot to save iteration steps and uh, converge towards uh, the better modeling, which would, as Etienne finished uh, his answer, yes, uh, badly fabricated, but perfectly performing. Yeah, yes, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, regarding the file format, say, what kind of file format is uh, suitable for your uh, fabrication for us, system? STL can work fine. STL or direct programming uh, in G code, yes. 
Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, so, are there, are there any further questions from the audience? And any chat window? Okay. Okay. So, since uh, okay, there are no further questions. So, let us thank the invited speaker again for his uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Professor.